Welcome, everyone. We're just letting people into the Zoom room and uh, we'll begin shortly. We're so glad that you could join us uh, for this lecture on Zoom tonight. And um, since it is uh, 7 p.m., I'm going to begin with some opening remarks. Uh, just one housekeeping bit uh, for everyone joining us on Zoom tonight. Uh, we have disabled the chat, but we have a fully functional Q&A function um, on your Zoom screen. You should see that in the center of the screen at the bottom. And please do use the Q&A if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, or if you have any comments or concerns that you want to give to uh, the organizing team behind the scenes, uh, that is your channel of communication for us. So please do uh, feel free to use the Q&A function uh, freely. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to uh, bid everyone a good evening and thank you all for coming. My name is Trani Grand and I'm the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Regina. On behalf of the faculty and our Dean Shannon Day, it's my honor to welcome all of you to the 2022 Dr. Gordon Wachowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Lecture. As we begin tonight's event, we honor and acknowledge all of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples who have lived, traveled and gathered on these lands for thousands of years. And we give thanks for the land where the University of Regina sits. The Faculty of Arts believes that through commitments to decolonization and reconciliation, we can move forward together from a place of understanding and respect. Each of us, no matter what our background, has a role to play in reconciliation. I am of European settler descent, born and raised on Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 lands, and grateful now to be living and working on Treaty 4 territory. The University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. These are the territories of the Nehiawak, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. I want to acknowledge that colonial violence continues to negatively impact Indigenous peoples. I recognize that we are gathered virtually in an institution with a colonial history and a colonial present. We aim to continually lessen ongoing colonial harms through speaking about them. We hope that the Faculty of Arts public lectures provide one way of building understanding and moving forward with the work of truth and reconciliation. And in the case of this lecture, with important conversations about criminal justice and policing. Let me tell you about this lecture series. The Dr. Gordon Wachowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Lecture is made possible by the generous support of the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan, an organization dedicated to enhancing legal education and research in this province and responding to ongoing challenges facing the administration of justice. In 2005, the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Chair in Police Studies was established within the University of Regina Faculty of Arts to enable our university to function as a center of excellence in police studies and to support issues of direct relevance to policing in Saskatchewan. In February 2011, the Law Foundation lecture was renamed the Gordon Wachowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Chair in Police Studies Lecture in recognition of the key role played by Dr. Gordon Wachowski in the establishment of the Chair in Police Studies. The title change acknowledges Dr. Wachowski's years of service with the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan, as well as the contributions he has made to the University of Regina, including his service on the Board of Governors, contributions for which Dr. Wachowski has been presented an honorary doctorate. Today, the lecture is known 
as the Dr. Gordon Wachowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Lecture. Each year in support of the goals of the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Chair in Police Studies, a renowned expert in the field of criminal justice is invited to the U of R to present a public lecture and con contribute to a national conversation about policing. This is a crucial dialogue we are pleased to continue tonight. We've been fortunate to have welcomed a host of renowned guest lecturers uh, to this series, this lecture series. Past lecturers have included Harold Sapers, Correctional Investigator of Canada, with a talk entitled, Some Reflections on the Discourse of Crime and Punishment in Canada, U of T Center for Criminology and Sociology professor, Mariana Val, excuse me, Valverde, with a talk entitled, Beyond the Criminal Law, What Local and Provincial Authorities Can Do to Regulate Sexually Oriented Business, and 2019 speaker, the esteemed late best-selling author and former Crown Prosecutor, Harold R. Johnson, whose lecture was entitled, Changing the Story We Tell Ourselves About Alcohol. The Faculty of Arts was deeply saddened to hear of Harold Johnson's passing in February, and we extend our condolences to his family and to all those whose lives he touched with his commitment to truth-telling and his critique of the Canadian justice system. Tonight, we are delighted to add Professor Llewellyn to our list of esteemed speakers. In a moment, I will invite Dr. Rick Riddell to introduce our speaker. But first, let me expend, uh, extend my appreciation to the organizing team, including the lecture series committee, Dr. Martin Hewson, Dr. Brett Dolter and Charisma Thompson, to the arts project manager, Milagro Charrier, the arts communication officer, Kara Vincent, and last but certainly not least, to Stephen Martin of AV Services for his high level technical uh, assistance, and I might add training. So with that, um, I'm delighted to turn this over to Dr. Riddell, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good evening. We're honored tonight to have Professor Jennifer Llewellyn with us. Uh, she's joining us from the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie, Dalhousie University. Professor Llewellyn is an internationally renowned expert in the theory and practice of restorative approach. And her th teaching and research are focused in the areas of relational uh, theory, restorative justice, truth commissions, peace building, international and domestic human rights law, public law, and Canadian constitutional law. Professor Llewellyn has served in a number of high profile positions throughout her career, including director of Nova, Nova Scotia's Restorative Justice Community Research Alliance, and she currently serves as director of the International Learning Community on a restorative approach. Now, in addition to her scholarly work, her research, she's an international subject matter expert in the area of restorative justice. and. Uh, She's advised different, the federal government and different provincial governments and non-government organizations throughout Canada and supported many uh, governments, projects and programs, including the Nova Scotia Restorative Justice Program, making Nova Scotia one of the uh, leaders in restorative justice in Canada. She's previously served with the Assembly of First Nations and the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the response to residential school abuse and has worked with other nations, including the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Jamaican government, the government of New Zealand and the United Nations. She's, uh, Professor Llewellyn has, has been recognized with a number of awards, including the Ron Weeb Restorative Justice Award from the Correctional Service of Canada, and was a recipient of the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Award. Uh, and, in her spare time, if there is any, she's also published several, several highly regarded books on relational theory and restorative justice. We're honored tonight to have her deliver the Gordon Wichkowski lecture. Professor Llewellyn. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. It's so nice uh, to be with you. Um, it's an honor. Uh, it's an honor to have been invited to give this year's uh, Law Foundation of Saskatchewan lecture. I was uh, so excited, actually, about the opportunity to visit the University of Regina. It would have been my first uh, visit and to have the chance to uh, to spend time meeting and learning from the vital um, community of scholars and, and researchers at the Faculty of Arts. And of course, having the chance to be with the justice and community partners and policing partners in Saskatchewan, um, you, you've long been such incredible uh, leaders right alongside with Nova Scotia in restorative justice in Canada. So I, I, I feel like I spend my pan, pandemic having regrets, but, uh, but the continuing challenges and uncertainties of the pandemic didn't make that possible. Um, I do hope there'll be another time uh, in the future for a proper visit, but for now, uh, I am happy uh, to be able to do this virtually and to uh, and to be with you in that way. Coming to you from the restorative lab here in Halifax, uh, which is in Mi'kmaq, the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and a place that I'm also very grateful uh, to live and, and to learn. So the title of my talk tonight reflects, I think, the moment or moments uh, that we're living in and the significant movements that are coalescing around the urgency of reimagining public safety to meet the failures and the challenges of our current approach, which relies centrally and heavily on policing. Clarity of this need to start to see things differently, to be different has been made so plain and clear to us by several movements uh, related to truth and reconciliation, to murdered and missing indigenous women and girls, to uh, the movement for Black Lives Matter, uh, the Me Too and the Time's Up movements, uh, movements to end domestic and gendered violence and violence related to gender identity and expression. And amid these various movements for change, we also continue to experience and to confront uh, poignant moments that offer stark and, and often painful reminders of the failures uh, that our old and our current ways of securing our safety and our well being are in need of urgent change. It's in these moments that institutional and systemic injustices present themselves clearly through individual incidences and harms. And these include incidences of police and state violence of failures of public safety that renew public outrage as they shock our consciousness, even and especially when they're close to home, and at the same time often numb us by their familiarity as we cease to be surprised by them as they happen over and over. Of course, there's also the insights and the urgency that's been brought to us by this pandemic moment we're living, feels like a, a really long moment sometimes, which has tested our public systems of care, of safety and of justice, and has revealed the inadequacy of private ordering and solutions in the face of really collective threats to our well-being. We've come to see plainly the impacts of existing systemic inequalities that have produced very different pandemic experiences and literally been the difference between life and death for some. COVID has revealed to us and renewed for us fundamental questions about what is required to secure our mutual safety and well being and how we are to achieve this. In this moment, we've seen both increasing calls for policing for enforcement and protection, and at the same time as we're experiencing significant questioning of the value of our, of our safety, uh, of this to our safety through calls for defunding police. These seemingly conflicting calls, though, are both responses, in a way, to a recognition across these moments, across these movements, of the limits of law, order and enforcement as means of securing the conditions of equality and justice that we need to meet our most basic needs for security. Calls and actions that are emerging in this moment and from this range of movements to reimagine public safety have shaken trust in systems, in institutions, and in each other. 
And it's caused us to question and reconsider what we know, uh, what we need from each other, what we need from governments, what we need from community, from private and public sector organizations, institutions, systems, and services. So the, the recent calls across North America and beyond to defund police have really created significant debate, at least in part because of this tension about how to respond to these moments in which we experience threats to safety. I, I think the debate is some, has sometimes been misplaced, perhaps misunderstanding the purpose and the intentions behind much of the most serious advocacy for defunding police. At its core, calls to defund police are intended, I think, as calls to reimagine to find a different way forward, to meet our individual and collective needs for safety and for justice. In this way, the defund movement is actually aligned with the prison abolitionist movement. They are both intended to shake our assumptions, to shake us from our ways of thinking about the necessity of how we currently do things, right? To, to require us to imagine a different world, to imagine if a different way is possible. So if not prisons, what? What would we do? If not police, what would we do? Those are the right questions that we need to hold and that these movements are pushing us, demanding us uh, to examine. So it's less a rejection of the importance of public safety or of the need to invest in it, I think, than about breaking this this tight identification of public safety with policing, with state controlled surveillance and enforcement. It's about helping us see that policing is one strategy or approach to public safety, but it's not the necessary one, the inevitable one. And to see how policing is actually structured to maintain order by enforcing law. So policing is not structured or intended or mandated to question the justness of existing order, but to maintain it. Where our existing order is then unjust, policing it, protecting it, will reinforce and perpetuate that injustice. It will maintain the order structured by hierarchies that privileges and the privileges that they afford to some at the expense of others on the basis of race, of gender, gender identity, ability, religion, and other factors. Police are actually very clear about the limits of their role in this respect. They, they don't make law, they enforce law. And one of the most powerful examples um, for me was watching the police responses to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their historic the historical role uh, in that system, particularly um, with respect to uh, questions around returning children who ran away. And they said, with great pain, actually, some, that it just wasn't their role to be questioning why they ran or whether they should be returned. Reliance then on the idea of policing as the way to live safely with one another is not working. It's you know, never worked for some, particularly those who are being policed, to ensure that they don't disturb the order of things. But it's now evidently not working in a range of ways for those of us who have sought this protection and even benefit from this protection. And this is not an attack on those who take up this role. The many, many who do so for the right reasons, at great cost and for whom its failures are most painful. They too are increasingly clear that the approach and the use of policing and the ways in which we are relying on it for our public safety must change. While there are clearly bad policies and practices that must be stopped or changed, there are clearly bad actors who need to be removed from their roles the failure of policing as an approach to public safety will not be remedied by reform. It requires transformation. 
And here I mean not merely transformation of institutions or of systems of policing or public safety, but actually a deeper transformation of our very understanding of what public safety means and what it requires. It's this transformation in our way of thinking about public safety that I think is at the root calls and actions to defund police. It is intended to invite or force us then to think about, if not this, then what? What should we fund? What do we need for public safety? These calls to imagine a different way, to defund, to transform, they evoke strong emotions for many, many of whom actually were on social media responding to the announcement of this talk. Uh, some were defensive, some incredulous, some angry, some cynical, uh, some hopeful, yet impatient. And for many, whether you're supportive or not, this reimagining, questioning the way we do things, the way we've done things, is deeply disorienting. So here I wanna share um, a slide presentation with you also, so you have something to look at other than me. Um, let me see if I can, there we go. Can you see that? I'll look to Rick and see if he can nod for me, great. Um, so here I think actually the work of Amy Harbron is really helpful to us. She's a philosopher, a feminist, a relational theorist, um, Canadian, so, uh, so, so uh, always proud of that fact. Um, and she writes on disorientation and its role in our moral life. Um, and her work recognizes the difficulty and the potential of this kind of collective disorientation that we experience as we kind of have to face the fact that we cannot continue to do things the way we've been doing them for so long. As we've lost trust or lose trust in the ways in which we've thought about and sought out public safety. Harbin describes disorientation as human experiences of losing one's bearings, such that life is disrupted. Uh, and it's not clear how to go on from here. Right? They can paralyze, overwhelm, embitter, misdirect. And this is at least in part because being disoriented means not knowing what to do or where to go next. Right? But these moments are also, she points out, potentially valuable and important because in some cases of disorientation, she says individuals gain new forms of awareness of political complexity and social norms and new habits of relating to others and to an unpredictable moral landscape. Disorientation, uh, she, she claims based on her studies of situations and experiences of disorientation, can have what she refers to as non-resolutionary -res effects. So this means they can help us act without first helping us resolve what to do. Disorientations can have the power to motivate profound and long-term shifts in moral and political action. They can provide important insight and impetus to respond to systemic injustice and to harmful oppressive contexts. So to be clear, Harbin doesn't think disorientation is good for its own sake. She doesn't think we should start seeking it out. She doesn't even think it's going to necessarily result in transformation. In her words, she says, I love this, it tenderizes more than it transforms. So sort of making us ready for, preparing us for, um, right for transformation um, uh, in terms of what can come next. The risk, of course, is that our instincts, given the level of discomfort we experience with this orientation, is that we'll move quickly to reorient ourselves, right? Often leading us to return to the ways we know or to take the shortest route to find our way again, because we don't otherwise know how to move forward without resolving what to do. And so we just decide what to do and do it. I think we can actually see this happening in response to the calls and efforts to defund police uh, or transform public safety. We watch our, 
We, we watch as we move quickly to solutions so that we can see and know what to do. Um, and when we do, we take up that essential time and space needed to reimagine. In the spirit of this idea, you know, that it's okay. Indeed, maybe it's really important that we are disoriented right now. I don't actually come to this lecture with an answer or possible answers to the question, what should we do? Or where should we go with public safety? I fully acknowledge there is no easy way to resolve this disorientation moment we're in. However, I do think we need to take seriously what would be required to move forward without first resolving what to do, right? Without knowing the answer, because what is clear is we must move. We must move. We must start this reimagining. So how do we do that without a clear uh, picture of the alternative that we're seeking? How do we act on the insights we've gained from this disorientation about what public safety requires. I think a restorative approach to justice um, and in connection public safety can and should play a key role in our moving forward to reimagine public safety. So many of you will be familiar with um, restorative justice as it's developed in connection with uh, the current criminal justice system. Just going to try to get this PowerPoint to move forward, which it is now not. So I'm going to unshare my screen and try again, okay? And here we go. Let's see. All of the coaching I got from the very wonderful staff at, at uh, University of Regina are not responsible at all for my failure to be able to move my PowerPoint. So let's see if this will now work. No, it won't. Okay. You're sharing your screen, Jennifer. You want to pick just the PowerPoint slides. So pick a different share. Okay. Uh, let me do that then. Great. I think I, I think I have now found the technology. Sorry about this. There we go. And so I will share my screen or I will try. There we go. There, there we go. So many of you will be familiar uh, with restorative justice as it's developed in connection with the current criminal justice system. Restorative justice uh, programs and practices have become a familiar part of the criminal justice landscape in Canada, largely as an alternative um, to mainstream criminal justice system by which cases are diverted at various stages of the criminal justice process. Restorative justice has also shaped policing in Canada, not only as referral agents to restorative justice programs, but also as aligned with community uh, policing strategies and as police forces incorporated some restorative practices directly into their work, starting perhaps most notably uh, with the uh, work of the RCMP and their community and restorative justice initiatives in the 1990s. This is not actually the sense in which I'm suggesting we should look to restorative justice to reimagine uh, public safety. I think that these efforts have been important and instructive at their very best. These restorative just justice programs have invited others, including victims and community, into the work of justice and public safety and created space in which we can come to understand what justice actually looks and feels like for those most affected and what's required to support this different approach. These processes have demonstrated the importance of paying attention to root causes, to contexts, to circumstances in which harm happens and have revealed the complex and relational nature of the work of justice and safety. However, Existing as they do within and alongside mainstream legal systems, restorative justice programs and practices 
have been somewhat limited in their transformative potential and impact. This fact has led some to rightly, I think, express concern and critique about the potential co-optation of restorative justice by systems and to favor instead language and orientation towards transformative justice as a signal of their commitment to fundamental transformation that can't happen if it's controlled by or reliant on the very systems that need transforming. Transform transformation requires, in their view, a move away from state-centered systems um, and, control and handing control more over uh, to communities. I agree, actually, with this critique, but not with the idea that there is some gaping distance between the intentions and understanding of restorative justice and transformative justice. And I've written about that um, this year in the International Journal, great journal if you wanna learn more about restorative justice. So that is my pitch um, to, uh, to look up the journal. The experience with restorative justice has actually offered a different way of thinking about justice, not just doing it. And this, I think, is what's important and has seeded our imagination of a different way. Uh, it is in this that a restorative approach to justice can be essential to our reimagining of public safety. So restorative justice is best understood, I think, for our purposes and in this moment, not as a program or a set of practices, but as a way of thinking about justice. It's a relational theory of justice that sees justice as fundamentally concerned with just relations. It starts with a view of the world and human beings that's relational. And this means more than that people live in relationships. Of course, this is a true fact about the way in which the world is organized. The claim here I'm making is um, a more fundamental one. It's a claim that we live in and through relationships and could not do otherwise, that we are relational beings, always existing in relation with others and the world, that we came into being, that we continue to become who we are in and through networks of relationships, and our relations are structured and shaped and nested in other sets of relations. If this is true, it requires us then to pay attention to the importance of relationships, not because they're good or bad, for as much as they can be harmful or threatening or destructive, they are also essential to our well being and our safety. This relational worldview is deeply rooted in Indigenous knowledge and life ways. It's been affirmed across many faith traditions, philosophies, science, arts. Indeed, it's actually so common and familiar that one might think it's true until one pays attention to how we structure our institutions, systems, and social structures, particularly in the West, where we kind of tell a different story about who we are and what we deserve and need, a story that's deeply premised on a more individualistic idea of who we are and how we live. One that's bound up in individual achievement where we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, where we protect ourselves with individual rights as swords or shields, with freedom as the pinnacle and freedom from others and interference as the pinnacle of those rights. And where our ideas of safety are premised on protecting us from one another but these systems are failing us. And I suggest to you they're failing to keep us safe and well precisely because they fail to account for who we are, for our relational nature, and therefore the relational needs and nature of justice and safety. This is what the current moments and movements that are calling for social justice and justice transformation are actually revealing, are demanding that we see the world as it is, as relational, and that we reimagine our institutions, our systems, our services, by whom and how they are provided accordingly. A restorative approach to justice places a focus on just relationships as core then to what we need to be safe and well and to do right by one another. 
Restorative justice is a relational approach to justice with clear implications then for how we imagine what's required for public safety. On this account, it can't be achieved then through maintaining order through law enforcement or the enforcement of laws. It must be concerned with establishing and maintaining the conditions that are needed for us to relate to one another in just ways. What would it mean then to approach public safety in this way? It's not about new processes or practices. It's about a relational approach to this work. And a restorative approach then offers the relational principles to guide that work. It's a conceptual framework then that helps us see differently, helps us look at things differently, informs the way we work and is relevant across the range of ways in which we work. And it's grounded in a set of relational principles that while it doesn't tell us what to do, it does tell us how we might go about it, right? How we might be different. So, a restorative approach then is grounded in these relational principles for practice. It, it, it invites us then to be relationally focused, right? To understand and look for the connections in, the, in, in between people and issues and impacts, to be comprehensive, holistic, and integrative in the way in which we work and the way in which we come to understand the world. So seeking to connect those dots between the issues, the incidences, the context, the causes, the circumstances, and then to try to respond in that way so that we're not siloed or carving up problems or people according to the services um, and systems that we have um, the, and the way in which they define and see the problems. So working less in siloed and fragmented ways. And if we're gonna work in this relational way, we actually need the knowledge and the experience and the participation of those who are affected and involved. And so we have to work in more inclusive and participatory ways. And when you match those two, you can see the restorative commitment not only to including people, but doing so in meaningful ways where their participation must be able to make a difference where those processes center first voice, think about the conditions and circumstances that people need to be able to participate authentically and well, thinking about the, the significance and importance of culture of being trauma informed and of orienting ourselves to meet the needs of those who are participating. And that means one size is not going to fit all. So we need to be working in responsive ways. We can't have rigid, uh, programs or services or practices or processes that are not adaptable or flexible or able to be responding to the relational context causes circumstances and needs. It shifts us this relational focus from only focusing on individual responsibility to also focusing on collective responsibility. So this is not an invitation to blame society, to relieve ourselves of our role in these relationships as co-authors um, in, in these uh, networks of relationships, but rather to say we must look at individual responsibility uh, and to understand it properly in the context of our collective responsibility. And likewise, we must look for our individual responsibility as part of the collective. We want then to think about how we bring people into this kind of work for justice and safety that defies these sort of simple stories, binary solutions and adversarial one side or the other, rather than a range of complex intersecting parts. And if we want to, to work in this more complex way and meet the challenge of, of relational approaches to public safety, to justice, we need to be working in more collaborative ways. That doesn't mean we need to be nice or hide from hard work and difficult, painful conversations and naming injustice. It means that when we meet to do that, we must be willing to look for the complexity of, of the various um, places we hold in that seats we sit in and that it will not be reduction, a reductionist to two sides nor solved by, by fighting one another um, in a way that hides that complexity. 
And we need to be thinking about being future focused. That doesn't mean you know, bygones, we don't care about the past. It means that we need to look back with a view to learning, to being proactive and preventative and solution focused for what just relations need, for what safety needs moving forward. So we have to pay attention then to the conditions and structures of our relationships as much as we do individual actions if we're wanting to do the work of public safety. We need to figure out how to support the conditions for just relationships and to respond to injustice in ways that pays attention to the relational nature of issues and needs if we wanna be safe and well. I wanna offer two examples of the difference working in this principled way might make to the way we approach and think about public safety, to the way we approach this work of reimagining. One's from my campus. Uh, here at Dalhousie, where we have a security service that has undertaken this restorative and relational reimagining of safety on our campus, of what is a safe campus, what does it mean, uh, led, led by the brilliant, uh, brilliant insights of, uh, of, of Jake McIsaac, um, who's been a, a longtime leader of restorative work here. And, and here we're thinking about, in, you know, he tells the story in a much more entertaining way than I will about discovering that what we actually needed was more than security folks who came and locked and unlocked doors to keep us safe, but rather built the relationships and the belonging and the kind of networks of relationships and conditions, structural and interpersonal, that we needed to be and feel safe on campus. And that's been a, 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 not an overnight process, but a process that involved a lot of listening to what people needed from one another on that security team, from that security team, and in the broader university. And it's made a difference. They don't get called as much to lock and unlock the doors. Um, now they get called upon to uh, try to build actually relational capacity on campus in response to um, harms and systemic issues. The other example is from uh, the recent uh, public inquiry, the restorative inquiry into the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. The inquiry was established here in this province. It finished in 2019 uh, out of the visions of generations of former uh, resi uh, residents of this child welfare institution that opened in 1921 and continued uh, on into the 90s, uh, who experienced individual abuses tied to uh, the history and the present reality of systemic racism uh, in this province and in which and out of which the home was founded and operated. The inquiry examined the systems of care and the failures, including those by police who failed former residents as children and also as adults when they came forward looking for safety and security and justice. And out of their work at the inquiry, they recommended a relational shift. And so if you wanna uh, read and learn more about that work, I've put the um, website where the report is accessible uh, on the slide. And this shift represented that they call for a represented a shift to be human-centered rather than system-centered. And it's this shift that will be brought about that is entailed by a restorative approach. And I think it offers us some helpful cues about the ways we would need to work differently in a reimagined approach to public safety. So you can see that it invites this shift from the ways in which our systems are currently structured and operate, our systems that help us or seek to help us secure our safety and serve up justice, where they are siloed and fragmented rather than integrated and holistic and inviting those ways of working. We would need to shift from systems that are deeply um, structured by accountability and accountability mechanisms, which are uh, blame focused and backward focused rather than focused on building and fostering the conditions for taking of responsibility moving forward. How do we build that responsibility to what we owe one another, not uh, accountability or blame for what we've done. And you can see the nature of that shift uh, as represented on the slide between moving from blame and liability focus of systems to more problem solving and solution focused 
from the individual focus uh, to more relational focus, from that kind of risk adverse uh, orientation to orienting ourselves steadfastly around the needs and harms of those most affected and central, um, from being defensive, that kind of defensive posture to one that's more open to learning, to be allowed to fail fast rather than reactive, being proactive um, and responsive and, and, um, and not protective. And from those systems that are oriented around compliance to rules, to laws, to systems as the way we're going to keep one another safe and meet one another's needs, rather than to more responsive approaches to regulating our relationships and creating the conditions in which we can meet one another's needs. And from systems premised on these and rewarding transactional relationships, as opposed to the kind of work and the kinds of system uh, work we would need uh, to build and foster and reward um, trusting relationships. And all of this means moving from professionally controlled systems to those with more shared governance in which we participate collaboratively and in partnership uh, with communities uh, and with families. This is a culture shift then, right? This isn't about a shift that systems are bad in and of themselves, that we don't want to be able to marshal the collective capacity to take care of one another, but that our current systems are the way they are, not simply because of a few policies or a few practices, or we just need a new leader. They are deeply embedded. It's why they're so easy to replicate, even when we get new people and new ideas at the level of culture. And if that's the case, then we actually need a new paradigm and processes that can support institutional and culture change if we want to be able to not only reimagine, but, uh, but, but live out that new imagined version of public safety. So we need significant patience to unlearn old ways of thinking. So, a restorative approach then I think is important in this other way of reimagining public safety. Because one of the significant challenges we face is how are we gonna go about this? If we kind of have a sense of what we don't, shouldn't do, and more how we should be doing things, if not what, how are we gonna get there, right? This work is not gonna be easy, right? It's not a matter of changing tactics or personnel or even budget lines. It's going to require collective reimagining for culture change, coming to understand safety differently together, and then tapping the knowledge, the wisdom, and the capacity that's required to secure our safety in this different way. It's not work that government can do alone. It's not work that they get to ignore or offload without ensuring resources and support needed for collective action and impact and for their responsibility to remove the barriers that they've erected that will get in the way. We need an approach capable of building the collective understanding and commitment needed for new thinking and new action and the trust that we're gonna need to make it succeed. Put simply, the way we pursue this change will affect the change that's possible. And a restorative approach I think is essential to the process through which we might reimagine public safety. So what might this look like? Well, here I want to turn back again to the restorative inquiry that had this audaciousness of thinking of a different approach to how it might respond to a fundamental change around systemic racism um, and around failures of care in this province. And so I offer you some images that reflect these principles, this different way that this as a process of inquiry sought to bring people together to do this very hard work of contending with our past and reimagining our future. The first of those images is the Sankofa. The Sankofa is, uh, is a, a principle in African philosophy represented by this image of a bird with its neck uh, craned backwards, uh, reaching for an egg in its beak, but with its feet firmly planted forward, indicating that it's going to move forward. And it signifies that it's okay, it's not taboo to go back and fetch it, that we need to look to the past for that which is good. And by good, we don't mean pleasant. By good, we mean the things we need to know, the things we need to see and understand and carry with us so that we can make the future different and secure the future together. 
but we don't look back to blame. We don't look back in that accountability way. We look back to gather that which we need to be responsible together for moving forward in a good way. And the former residents kick to this as their talking piece, as they imagined a different justice process, a different way. And they describe that way as represented by the candle uh, that they're lighting uh, there um, as their journey to light hugely significant to what we've been talking about here. They didn't have a destination, right? They invited people on a journey, on a journey to different, on a journey to better, on a journey to the light that was represented by a just way, but it would be made just by the traveling to it together, by their commitment to one another and generously to others, even those who had harmed them to leave no one behind who was willing to join this journey. And then they needed a process that was capable of once these people were invited in, supporting that journeying together. And they envisioned a process and built a process around these restorative principles that involved working together, that kind of intra-party way with those who needed to uh, understand not only build their relationships with one another, but their relationship and responsibility to the past, to one another in, in, in relation to the past and the issues that uh, it presented. And upon the strength of that, to be able to meet with and build relationships with others from whom they needed to learn and understand and to build that different way of understanding and to con consistently be moving outward to include uh, more and others in the building of those trusted relationships and of that knowledge that was needed to then um, take collective action. Uh, in terms of planning and action in real time. So that the, their vision of this inquiry was that it would mobilize the capacity for change, for trying um, uh, in real time, right? For creating that space in which they could try and test new ways of imagining and doing together. And they did that um, throughout. This model, uh, interestingly, has been then um, uh, taken up and looked to or the possibility it presents of the way in which they invited people in. They worked with those in government, with police, uh, with those in community, with those in child welfare, uh, with those who had harmed them and those who uh, had been allies and, uh, and built this journey uh, to light. Um, and the pathways that would have to continue to be traveled differently. And it's in this that I think a restorative approach offers significant uh, promise. We've seen some of that taken up uh, in the similar work to reimagine public safety in the US around addressing uh, police violence against brown and black bodies and the history of racism in that country and to imagine truth, um, reconciliation and restorative justice. Fanya Davis um, has been a significant leader of that, um, a, a civil rights leader in the US. Um, along with her sister, Angela Davis. And I, I love this quote and I wanna, I wanna end with it because I think it represents this significant contribution of a restorative approach to the work ahead of us in reimagining. And she says, I think that restorative justice is really, as a really important dimension of the process of living the way we want to live in the future, embodying it. We have to imagine the kind of society we want to inhabit. We can't simply assume that somehow, magically, we're going to create a new society in which there will be new human beings. No, we have to begin that process of creating the society we want to inhabit right now. It's in this way that restorative justice is essential to meeting this moment of disorientation, where it's clear we cannot continue but we don't know what to do instead. A restorative approach helps us imagine how we need to be different right now with one another in the work of this reimagining so that we build the capacity and the foundation for a new reimagined approach to public safety. So I'll stop sharing there. I'll turn it over to you, Rick. You are on mute. 
Uh, just a, a few questions here from the, the audience. I'll start with uh, one that talks about Saskatchewan has a very high rate of rural crime and that, uh, uh, especially in the North, and there's dissatisfaction with the current model of policing. And our, our guest is asking about how you move towards restorative corrections, rehabilitation and solutions but the political system that drives the state controlled apparatus is not responding to change other than to put more resources into police and prisons. You know, I, 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 it's a great question. And it's actually a great question because I think it's one of the um, pressure points that's been so revealed during uh, the pandemic, right? Which is for, actually in lots of areas, um, the, the, um, sort of fly in courts, the apparatus of justice, the sort of policing uh, ways in which we have policed from afar or with people going to both rural communities and particularly sort of fly in communities um, has had to be ch shifted and changed as has our reliance on corrections, right? As we, you know, in our province literally started to be able to empty uh, correctional facilities and not use them in the same way when they when when they became evidently even if they had been otherwise harmful evidently risky and harmful we questioned our reliance on these very strategies and had to think about what could we do instead in Nova Scotia one of the things that let us do that quickly um, the chief judge has said is that we already had been having these very conversations around a restorative approach. So people were able to get their heads around having to do something else different and what that different might be fairly quickly, which then let them be a part of that, discovering that together where they could convene groups of people. The same is happening in some communities, right? It's not that no one dealt with any problems while we didn't fly in court to fly in communities. And so one of the questions, one of the things I hope we do is not lose those moments and those lessons, right? Where we, where we actually now need to sit down and say, okay, before action, I want lots of things to return to the way they were. I would really like to leave my house more often, but I'm not sure that we want everything to return to the way it's been. Um, and so I'm hopeful in some sense that there might be a moment for this kind of a question, right? Which is, why are we, if we don't have to do this, why are we doing this? If we know things about the, the fact that these strategies don't work or work at a very high cost or only in very narrow circumstances, why are we using them when we don't have to, right? So one of the sort of conceptual ways I think we need to shift our thinking is to start to think about restorative justice as uh, a justice pathway and make a choice about which justice pathways we're traveling, right? So rather than think about it as, oh, we're all going this way unless we can find an excuse to divert off or a reason not to, or a reason not to rely on, why don't we start asking why we would use those systems, which rightly the questioner points out, aren't serving rural areas, aren't serving racialized communities, aren't serving Indigenous communities, aren't serving uh, remote communities. Um, if they're not, then, then is this a time? Is this a moment where we can say, how else could we do this? Um, I think we are seeing some, I mean, I think there's problematic ways of sort of selling this kind of a shift, right? Careful what you sell, people might buy it with this it's cheaper or it's ineffective or stop spending your money on that. We, we've tried that for a long time with restorative justice. It was a great sales pitch until people started to then not fund and not resource appropriately the investment of time and energy and effort of communities in doing justice this way. So I'm kind of wary of that as the, what do we do with the fact that the government keeps investing in this and really want to see us start to say, um, how is it that we need to be building this capacity and then ensuring that we're demanding that, um, that governments fund the, those pathways in the same way in which they fund um, those that aren't, uh, aren't um, working for the breadth of things in which they're applied to. 
I, I think that's about building those relationships. So the, so the stories of the pandemic, I guess, is part of my answer, are ones we cannot lose and we must take seriously in this moment if we want to be providing some kind of weight before you go back to this, uh, what should we be doing instead? Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Do you see restorative justice driven by the courts, by the police, or by society? And should there be more uh, restorative justice efforts in pre-charge or pre-sentence? Yeah, um, that's a, an awesome question. I, you know, I think we need part because we're sort of um, stuck in these assumptions about how justice gets done. I think we can't be cavalier about the kind of harm that is happening to people who are currently connected to stuck within, surveilled by our current justice system. And so I never want to be heard to say that we shouldn't be ensuring that where restorative justice can um, divert people from that, can create other opportunities, can make that system less harmful, but that's not important. But I don't think that's the transformative space. So I think we need to be doing that because it will re it's a harm reduction strategy for me, actually. But we actually do need to be investing more of our energy in terms of thinking about uh, where do we best secure and build just relations, right? Not just where do we react when harm happens, but how do we make harm happen less often? And when it does happen, how do we intervene earlier uh, in terms of su um, supporting a response um, that addresses the needs of those directly affected and takes seriously what we need to learn about fixing institutions. So, I mean, this is why I, I've spent a considerable amount of time uh, working on and alongside those working for this idea of restorative communities, right? Which is more than just a community that does a lot of these practices. I think sometimes it gets deployed like that. I think at its best, it's it's asking this question about um, what does it mean to be community? Because the other thing we can't romanticize is a lot of harm and exclusion and discrimination happens at the community level too, right? It is not always the case that um, that, that is our solution without a serious kind of commitment to how we're going to be with one another in community. But we, if we started to think about uh, what do we need from one another and how does that commitment to these principles, to this way of, of working, taking this approach to what we owe to one another, what we need from one another, and how we build the sorts of responses and systems we need at community level uh, and at the government level uh, to keep ourselves well and safe, absolutely we would be thinking about a restorative approach in neighborhoods, in communities, in workplaces, in playgrounds. Uh, we would be thinking about it um, at the Y and at the women's shelter. Uh, we would be thinking about what does it look like as we have uh, in schools. And then we would be thinking about where else we might need um, help and assistance to, uh, to work in this different way. Human rights commissions, um, hospitals. There's like, some incredible work going on in um, in uh, be starting in BC, but currently going on in um, Australia and New Zealand to imagine a restorative approach to healthcare and particularly uh, to support um, indigenous health where the, the trust in institutions um, has been so broken in terms of providing support for healthcare. So absolutely, I think this approach uh, needs to be uh, embedded in who and how we are in our institutions and structures at the community. And, and so maybe that's even earlier than earlier intervention. That's actually the sort of proactive and preventative ways in which we build communities that are more just and more inclusive and meet our needs. And then of course, we'd be better prepared for when we cause one another harm um, in order to respond in better ways. Uh, thank you, Professor Llewellyn. Uh, a sort of a follow-up question that, that someone has just asked is, uh, how do we support and build the capacity required to realize these changes that you envision? Right. So, um, so I think there's a whole bunch of ways in which we can do that, right? Um, I think the more that we can find people, so, so one of the temptations is we need to, um, um, 
invest in a whole range of sort of roving restorative facilitators and doers. That would also be good. You know, more people who, who, who work in this way. But I think the profound opportunity to build capacity is actually to be working with those who are um, already leaders in community, right? Already community organizers, already teachers in classrooms, already um, um, uh, leaders of nonprofits or ki kids in, in um, after school clubs, right? Um, and building the capacity for them to be um, thinking about how they respond when things go wrong and how they include one another. And so that, that capacity building, um, I think, is, are, builds the seeds of this kind of larger scale transformation. Um, and and it, it, you don't have to wait for sort of a ribbon cutting. You can kind of start where you are. Um, I, I think here in Nova Scotia of the kind of um, profound difference it made when uh, one elementary school started to uh, take a restorative approach on the everyday in classrooms for how kids included one another in their curricular learning and what happened uh, when things went wrong on the playground um, or at the office, who all of a sudden from, from the basis of their expectations and their knowledge about what uh, what justice looked and felt like, started to bring that to their families, to their neighborhood disputes, to the mall, where well, by the time they were teenagers, to the youth drop-in center at the mall and their relationships with the security guards and with one another when something went wrong, and then on to campuses. And so there are ways in which I think the capacity building is about um, finding the opportunities where people can be um, uh, putting the lens on to ask what do just relationships look like here in unexpected places, right? Um, on the soccer team or or uh, or in or in the church committee, that might be the hardest one. I'm a minister's kid. I'll tell you that might be the hardest one. Um, but so I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is ensuring that we have opportunities to be able to equip people um, with places and spaces to learn about this, to have conversations, right? So I think universities and schools um, and, and, um, um, and professional development associations have roles to play. And I think we cannot forget that we uh, need to take whatever opportunities we have um, uh, in terms of our leaders of systems to create the space in which um, uh, this change can happen. And that isn't just about funding new programs and new, um, and, and, uh, and new agencies, that's good too. It's actually about starting to uh, create the space and permission to work in these more collaborative, non-siloed ways, to actually start to work in these more human-centered ways. Because as governments and as institutions try to do that, they will realize that they are not structured to do that. They don't have the skills to do that. They haven't rewarded that in terms of who they promote or how people work. And they'll have to make these kinds of changes on the everyday for the way in which people in the systems work. Um, and I, I think that sounds awesomely hard unless you lift your head tomorrow morning from your desk where you are or look at what's in front of you and say, now that I see this relationally and I think about this, do I have an opportunity to begin to ask different questions and to do different work? I think that's where it starts. It just has to start somewhere and a lot of somewheres. And we have to have ways to have those people find each other, to knit those somewheres together so that we can go everywhere. Thank you. Uh, we have one question that asks, do you see reform to police department as a start to transforming the justice system or the result of the transformation? Oh, it's a chicken and an egg question. Um, maybe the way I'd answer that is to say, I don't think you can, um, I don't think you can not um, pay any attention to, um, to police. So that is to say, I don't think this change can happen all around policing and not uh, foster and support the places and spaces and the safety, quite frankly, for these honest conversations within uh, policing and within uh, police forces, um, in no small measure because they are significant members of our communities. Um, and, and they have knowledge and understanding about the, uh, more acutely than, than, than you know, an academic at the law school about what's failing. 
uh, in terms of our approach to public safety. But we don't often create safe, open spaces uh, for them to be part of acknowledging what's not working um, uh, and, and being connected to others as part of this change. So I'm not sure it's an either or, but I think it can't be, it must be a both and. It can't be um, that we, um, uh, that we sort of hope to expel the problem of policing um, and not actually see, um, invite them on the journey to light in that way in which the former residents did. Um, and I, I think there are profound opportunities actually, if we can um, create that kind of a space and opportunity uh, for reimagining um, for, for police to be part of that. Um, um, and and, uh, and an important part of that. In terms, I have another question here in terms of uh, uh, the role that different uh, elements in society can play. Uh, the question is, what possibilities do you think the arts could offer as a space where we could have these sensitive conversations about community policing and policing? For example, could theater offer a space for respectful dialogue about restorative justice? and put relational principles into practice by bringing community as an audience together. Yeah. Um, we had the opportunity uh, almost a decade ago to, um, to work with a playwright in Nova Scotia. His name's David Craig, and he, um, he offered to come um, and, and uh, write a play that would tour um, schools uh, to call Tough Case um, to, uh, to help people understand restorative justice. What was fascinating about the process um, was that David came and spent a bunch of time in the province and, uh, and sort of um, toured and spent time with the various community agencies who do restorative justice. Um, and then came back and showed what he saw back to all of those. So we did this sort of workshopping process, which was this really, very restoratively oriented, kind of consistent with the principles around um, and demonstrate it really powerfully, the kind of place and space, the kind of honest conversations you need to be able to provoke if you're gonna reimagine. And so in that moment, we were not only trying to help him see how we all reimagine justice, but, but had that, that mirror back about what did he see? Did our principles show up and what he, what he saw or what he understood, how would you represent that? You know, and, and where, where are we tied to practices when what we actually want to be doing is helping people understand in different ways? And, and that's one example of, um, of the way in which I think the, there was no other way we would have got at that, that deep kind of principle conversation um, about the meaning of justice and how it shows up in a deeply practical way without just being about, you know, what do we do now? Where does the chair sit in this reflective learning way um, absent that opportunity? And I think that's, um, I think that's hugely important. We, we have another initiative right now where we um, have been taking a restorative approach alongside the former residents of the Home for Colored Children and the RI using VR technology in schools um, for students to experience um, the stories uh, and the resilience and the vision of justice of former residents um, immersed in uh, their memories of, of the home, but, but, but being able to relate to them, to stand alongside uh, them as they, as they um, share those truths. Um, and, and then be part of a restorative curriculum um, after that experience in terms of reflective learning. A transformative capacity um, for people to be in relationship in the ways they need to learn and understand differently and to transform their understanding um, of their own communities um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and what they need to be thinking about in terms of justice. So, um, so absolutely, I mean, and, and the ways in which restorative processes invite the use of narrative of people's stories of co-authoring together uh, is deeply um, resonant and, and, and benefits greatly and would continue to do so from the wisdom of, uh, of, of artists and, and, um, and of those who support 
sort of deep, deep understanding and learning about the world through art. Uh, another question here that it's probably the easiest one you'll have to field tonight is how can we keep up to date with your research? Do you have a website or a web page where you uh, uh, make make your work available? I do, and the po the folks who work with me um, will be will be terribly upset that I that I did not put the web the website. So so it's www.restorativelab.ca, and uh, and you can find us um, on Twitter. Uh, at Restorative ILC, which stands for the International Learning Community that uh, that connects together lots of of, uh, of my colleagues and in, in other um, uh, who are similarly working for this kind of change around the world. And so, if you find us there, we can help you find others too. Uh, yeah, another question: Is there room in capacity building to re to imagine restorative policing? versus just the referral agents from traditional justice or gatekeepers into diversionary restorative programs and how would police work in more human-centered ways? Right, awesome, awesome question. Um, so I think two, uh, two ways to answer that. One is like, yes, um, yes, we should not be, um, I think one of one of the key uh, ways of reimagining um, uh, the sorts of people we would need to be supporting us in public safety, um, and the role that uh, that we might see people who are currently involved in policing continuing to play, uh, is uh, it's really helpful to think about what would that look like if they transformed, you know, in some ways like Dell Security did, right? If they um, had the opportunity to be thinking about not just uh, showing up and enforcing uh, the law, but being community agents uh, of supporting those kinds of connections and conditions people need, right? They're on the ground, they see and know um, what's happening, right? There are different models of how it is that you could have community-based um, uh, agents of safety and security and protection um, that we could reimagine. And I think there's places to start doing that in exactly the way the question asks, right? So one of the ways to do that is to, is to think about um, uh, where, where are there existing opportunities in terms of this work of transforming for police to not simply refer out to restorative uh, work, but to be thinking about how do we use the space of cautions, for example, in the system uh, to keep people out of the system, but to not have it be, you know, like a wag your finger warning and then and then next time you better know better next time. How is it that without net widening, without dragging people into unnecessary processes that they're able to uh, look for the community connections that might exist if if some if they think someone has uh, come to their attention and should come to the attention of the neighbors, the aunties, the teachers, the others who can help, right? How could they um, be those kinds of connectors in terms of where they know there are things that they can um, immediately are presenting as incidences or where they know there's patterns? How do they show up differently in places and spaces uh, where there are patterns of harm? How, you know, how do they think differently about their relationship and role um, with, uh, in terms of their, both their funding model and in terms of how they do their work? Uh, we've seen some really uh, fascinating harm reduction models, for example, about where police you know, might pick someone up and instead of arresting them or putting them in a drunk tank, um, ensure that they get the, navigate the kind of systems and services that they would need that are better oriented to keeping them safe um, than, uh, than those that they might uh, have at their disposal. And that requires first and foremost, offering help, building partnerships with other systems and community-based agencies um, and thinking about wherever right now they have opportunities um, to be more than just uh, referring people out to do that kind of work. Great, thank you. Are, are, do you have a, a, a still up for one or two more questions here? Great. Sure. Uh, he's asking. He's asking because it's eleven twenty at night here. <laughs> well, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> we have a question here about uh, uh, how do we suggest 
we deal with those who say that this cannot be done, that these changes can't be made. They're either too tough or, or too overwhelming. Um, well, I think you keep talking to them. Um, and I think you invite them into places and spaces where they can glimpse the possible. So I don't think you just, I mean, it is true that you can't spend, we cannot spend all of our energy um, trying to convince or trying to worry about the groups of people who um, can't see it or don't believe it or don't want to, because it's actually, it's too much for them. It's too disorienting. It's not in their interest. They have much to lose. Um, so, so on the one hand, I think, while, while we can't um, orient ourselves to convincing that 20% of people who are never going to move, um, nor can we only pander to the 20% of people who already think we're right and we're great. And so we surround ourselves with an echo chamber of those folks. There's a good majority of people in the middle who need opportunities um, to be invited in to see and glimpse differently. Um, and I, I, that happens in small ways and big ways, right? That is the conversations with neighbors or uh, sometimes I think we don't ask, right? Sometimes I think we wonder why people don't kind of want to see that justice can be done differently or we can keep each other safe differently. And yet we just assume that and so we don't ask. And the pandemic's been really interesting for that, right? We saw... Um, at least we glimpsed, it went away faster in some places than others, um, but we saw a, sh a shift in terms of uh, people's willingness to take care of one another, to check in on one another, uh, to think about the things we don't think about. How does that woman who never can get groceries easily down the road get groceries um, in a pandemic or after, right? So I think there are ways in which um, we don't need to give up on the people who can't or won't see it. Um, some, you know, sometimes the, the, the tougher they are to convince, um, the more, the, the, the greater the, the, the epiphany. But I also don't think we should orient all our efforts that way, right? I think there are ways to um, foster and support. My, my partner sometimes says he's convinced that I'm like spreading the word about restorative one like soccer mom conversation at a time. Uh, particularly if something I'm doing is particularly in the news. And I think that's probably right on some level, which is that's the greatest power we have is how we talk to one another about our expectations, about um, uh, how we want things to go differently or that things could go differently. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another question here uh, that asks about different systems and and in your talk, you talked about the police, there, there's shortcomings in the way that policing and the criminal justice system is, is happening, but there's also shortcomings in the health system, in the education system, in our social services system. How do we, how do we make that sort of large scale change? So, I mean, I think the reality is we police, the logic of policing, not where police, officers go, but the logic of policing as the way to keep each other safe inhabits a whole range of our institutions, right? From the way the office works in schools to the way HR works in lots of places, um, right? That kind of risk-averse, system-centered, compliance with rules will keep us well, will make things go well. We That logic, that way of seeing the world and one another is not the domain of police uh, uh, institutions and services, nor the criminal justice system, right? I, you know, I'm amazed that sometimes in Nova Scotia, the justice system shows up restoratively. So we show up in a more relational and kind of in, invite us into thinking differently into institutions that are actually about education and change and health. And they're more punitive and more oriented to the enforcement of laws and rules as a way to ensure our well being than the justice system is being in a certain circumstance. And so, you know, I think part of absolutely we've seen. Um, 
on display for us in this disorienting yet insightful way, um, the limits of the way in which we're trying to keep one another safe, this sort of policing ourselves to safety, um, which if we, I think we shortchange the opportunity for real transformation if we make that only about police and police institutions and not about the idea and the approach of the way in which um, in the way in which we're structuring and approaching our institutions, our systems, and our services. And so, you know, the good news is that means there's lots of opportunities in all the places and spaces we are to reveal that logic, right? To say, what, why, why is this how we're trying to keep one another safe? Why is this the way in which we would respond? There's also then a huge need um, to be to be thinking differently in this more relational way uh, across a range of our um, our social systems and our community based systems. And I think the truth of the matter is, if we just defund police and we keep acting the way we're at, in which we're acting in child welfare and healthcare and uh, on university campuses and in HR uh, and and at human rights commissions and labor tribunals, I'm not sure that. In fact, I am sure that that is not going to bring the change in which we see, right, the justice that we see, the just relations we need. And so I think part of what restorative justice does in this relational way is have us look in a more capacious and a broader way at where the work of justice resides and then where we need to be ensuring that we're doing that work on the everyday in the places and spaces in which we live, we learn, we work, we pray, we play, that we need to be thinking about how is it that we're building these kinds of just relations that keep us safe and well, that the work of justice and just the responsibility of the police and the justice system anymore if we start to think about it this way. Oh, Professor Llewellyn, you've given us so much to think about tonight, and we really appreciate the insight that you've shared with us. Uh, any sort of final words that you want to share with our audience tonight? I, I really, I, it is, I think we've seen both the best in human beings during the pandemic um, and in the midst of, you know, incredible challenges around reconciliation around Black Lives Matter. I think that's, I think that has been um, difficult and painful within families, within communities. Um, as a society, but I do think that I do think there really is something in this um, moment of disorientation, moment of seeing and doing differently, that gives us um, hope, and and that hope resides in the fact that um, we can we can be different. I don't think we can just be different by doing different. I think we have to think differently. I think we have to create opportunities to be different together, right? To, to, to be different together and then um, and then figure out, you know, what we do. Um, and it's a it's a hard space to be in, but I think it's um, I think it's an important space to be in. And it feels like a kind of a hopeful space to be in. So I thank you for the opportunity to to be part of this lecture that's brought me lots of um, lots of hope. Again, Professor Llewellyn, thank you so much for for joining us tonight in Regina and uh, uh, thank you for all the, the participants who, who, you know, uh, who visited with us and, and shared their questions. We, we apologize that we couldn't get to every single question that people had asked, uh, but uh, we hope that uh, if you have those questions, maybe you could follow Dr. Llewellyn's work and uh, uh, that will provide those sort of answers for you. Again, and thank you for everything, the organizing committee tonight and everybody who put everything together to, uh, to enlighten us about this, uh, this approach to justice. Thank you.